going to be talking about prayer and fasting. And if you're a part of our church for any length of time, you know that over the years we have often had seasons of fasting. We don't structure it, at least not up till now. We haven't had it at a regular time every year. But it seems like about every year God will lead us into a time of fasting. And we're going to be fasting in the month of October. And I'm announcing it today because next Sunday we have Pastor Fermin with us from Tijuana, Mexico, and uh, he brings with him the Mexican anointing. So uh, you won't want to miss it. Come out next week. He is one of the finest pastors I know in North America, one of the leading pastors there in Mexico, and uh, so he's going to have a great word on prayer for us right here. And we, we learn so much from other people, from other nations. I learned a lot from Carl from Sweden. We can learn from our brother there in Mexico. And so next Sunday, get ready for that. Then right after that, we're going to be having a time of fasting and prayer. We're going to be doing that for 21 days. If you have your notes, just get that out. Let me go through a couple points on the fast so that we have that covered. And it's good just to know you can take this with you. Don't hesitate to download the app as well. Our pastors write a blog every week that supplement what we're talking about. And uh, Pastor Karen, you did a great job on your blog talking about prayer and how to change prayerlessness to prayerfulness. If you missed that, just get on the blog and, and read that. It'll encourage your faith. It really will. So in this little handout here, there's some things to cover about fasting. As I mentioned, over the years, we've done different types of fasts. Sometimes we fasted for one day. Sometimes we fast for seven days. We've done a 21-day fast. And... And in different times, we've, we've just felt God lead us in a different way. Uh, and different types of fasts. A, a Daniel's fast, where we cut out meats and sweets, or a one meal a day, or total abstinence for a day. Different ways we've fasted. And we've always encouraged people to give up things that distract them from prayer as well. I'll never forget... One of the little girls that came up, we were having a time of fasting, and, and she was maybe seven years of, the age, of age, and she came running up to me, and she says, Pastor, I'm fasting, and we encourage our parents, you know, just work with your families, they'll, they'll know you're fasting, but you might want to be sensitive, and don't expect your kids to miss their meals, they'll need that, but you can still encourage them to participate, and, and so she had decided to participate, and I said, well, what are you fasting? She says, I'm fasting jewelry, and so for <laughs> 21 days, she wore no jewelry, and I Apparently for that little girl, that was a distraction. I don't know, that might be a distraction from you ladies, uh, but anyhow, for her, she was giving it up, and she was dead serious, no jewelry for 21 days, and I just loved her faith, I loved the simplicity of her heart, and she was all in. You know, another time we fasted, and uh, uh, we had, uh, the fast was over, and what we were expecting for didn't happen yet. Sometimes it happens during the fast, but often it, it won't come until after the fast, and uh, our breakthrough didn't come. We were believing for some documents to be done, for the city to give us some approvals when we were trying to get into this building and complete our, our, the plan that we had for it. And it didn't happen during that time. And, and after the fast, the Lord impressed on me to, to drink only water until the breakthrough came. And from what we heard from our consultants, it was only going to be a week or so. So I thought, well, I can give up coffee and everything else for, for, for a week. I could do that. And, and so I said, yes, Lord, I'll be only drinking water for a week. Well, a week came and went, and uh, we didn't have any answer. Then a month came and went, and, and we still didn't have any answer. And it was about six or seven months before we had an answer. And uh, I knew every type of water that there was. If you got me a bottle of Perrier, I could tell you it was Perrier. And I, I, I drank sparkling water. I drank hot water. I drank cold water drank lukewarm water. I, I, I mixed it up every which way I could, but it was still water. And then on that last day, we had our breakthrough, and I could finally have a cup of coffee, and I was looking forward to it. It was a Sunday morning, and I was waiting for that. Uh, but one of the ladies in our church, Rebecca, beat me to it, and she came into the service, and she walked right in with a cup of coffee, and the usher couldn't stop her. She said, I'm going to get Pastor a coffee this morning. So they brought a, a latte up to the podium, and I had my first cup of coffee, and it tasted so good. Anyhow, we have a lot of stories around fasting. It's always an exciting time in our church. Uh, our flesh hates it, but your spirit likes it. That's the way to sum it up. We, we don't like to fast. Our flesh rebels because we want to have certain things, but it's denying that because we want God more and we want to see a breakthrough more. Cheryl and I will fast personally. You can fast anytime personally. This is a corporate fast, but personally you can fast anytime you hit a wall. Prayer and fasting, they're a powerful combination. 
If you play cards, sometimes you get dealt an ace and you go, oh, wow, that's a good card. When am I gonna lay that card down? I'm gonna play my ace now. And you save it. You kind of put it in the back of your hand and you're just waiting for the right time to play the ace. And then, ah, now's the time to play it. Fasting is like your ace. You don't play it all the time, but there's times where I'm gonna play my ace. Because you're up against a wall, you need a breakthrough, you don't know what to do, pray and fast. Pull out your ace. Because you want a breakthrough more than you want food. That's one of the keys to fasting. It, it, it just works. Prayer and fasting just works. Uh, we've seen that over and over again. You wouldn't be sitting in the pew where you are today. You wouldn't be even watching online today if there wasn't a church that said, God, we're going to pray and fast. It's not our great prayers and it's not our great fasting. It was that we said, God, take us out of a position of unbelief to a position of belief so your power can flow into this scenario. We're talking about prayer tracks, and you have to lay the prayer track down. But sometimes it's just hard to get the prayer track down for God's power to come. Fasting helps your prayer get laid down so God's power can move into a situation. He's waiting to do that. So prayer and fasting is essential in the Christian life. So if you have your notes, just grab that quickly. Let me go through a few things. We'll talk a couple of verses. Then today we have communion as well. What is fasting? You might be brand new to church. I was a Christian for a long time before I had any kind of a fast. So you may be new to faith, you may not be a Christian, or you may be watching online, you haven't heard much about fasting. Maybe the only time you heard about fasting is because you're on a keto diet and you have to fast, or maybe you're on some type of a diet where there's fasting involved. And, and that has health benefits, no doubt about it. But this is a spiritual fast, and it will benefit your health, but it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual exercise. So a couple of things. What is not? It's not legalism. It's not an attempt to impress others. It's not earning an answer to prayer. It's, it's not a hunger strike. God, I'm not going to eat until you answer my prayer. That's... Not the attitude that we do this with. It's not part of a diet plan. It's not a weight loss program. Yay, the church is fasting. I'm going to lose five pounds. I've been waiting to lose five pounds. Uh, no, that's not, that's not what it's for. If that helps you and that happens, that's just a side benefit. That is not the purpose. Fasting is an outward response to an inward attitude. It's an inward desire of our heart. It's shutting down the desires of your flesh because you want to break through more. When Cheryl and I will fast for our personal lives, we'll, when we need a breakthrough, we'll just say, man, I really want to eat supper tonight, but I want the answer more than I want supper. And so I'll gladly go spend some time praying because I'd much rather have that than have a meal which satisfies for an hour or so. I need that breakthrough more. Fasting, in your notes there, moves us, not God, from a position of unbelief to a position of belief. Fasting, like giving and prayer, is an assumed practice. We'll find out in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, and when you give, not if, and when you pray, not if, and when you fast, not if. So he assumes as followers of Christ, we do this. This is normal Christian living. As a matter of fact, it's abnormal not to fast as a believer. The Bible is filled with examples of people who fasted. The early church fasted and prayed a lot. Jesus fasted and prayed, and we certainly are not above our master. If Jesus needed to fast and pray, how much more do we need to fast and pray? Moses fasted and prayed. Esther fasted and prayed before she went before the king. And sometimes you have a big business appointment in your life. Fast and pray. Ezra fasted and prayed when they had a dangerous journey. Maybe you're coming to Canada and you need a breakthrough at immigration. Your, your process is stalled. I encourage you to fast and pray. There's something about prayer and fasting when you're up against a hard place. Um, next page in your notes, so what's a corporate fast? Because we're calling for a corporate fast. You can have a private fast, you can have a corporate fast. And in the Bible, a corporate fast is when a leader calls for everyone to come together in prayer and fasting for a specific issue. An example was Ezra, when he took the people from Babylon to Jerusalem, it was very dangerous. They got together, they humbled themselves, and they prayed. Fasting is a humility action. It's humbling ourselves. God, I, I can't do it on my own. I need you, and I'm willing to lay down what I want for what you want. Well, you might be asking, when do we fast? You can prepare for it, October 1 to October 21. And uh, what we're doing is for 21 days, we're missing a meal. And I've had some people say, well, that's too much. And I've had some people say, that's not enough. 
Uh, if you want to fast more, you can fast more. That's up to you. But we're asking you to take time to consecrate yourself to prayer instead of eating. You can fast other things as well, but I think it should, uh, by definition, it should, it should cut our, our stomach. It should cut our flesh. It should, it should cause this engine of our bodies not to get what it wants. You know, we, we live in a world where we can buy about any kind of food we want. You can go to next door and buy about any kind of food you want. Most of us uh, don't miss meals. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if any of us here went without meals because we, we couldn't have food. In, in our city, even if, you, if, even if you're homeless, there's, there's more than enough places to get something to eat. Uh, where other countries, it's, it's much different. So it's good for us to say, uh, body, you don't get what you want. And it just shows, again, that we're not led by our body, but we're led by our spirit. Uh, we're not, the Bible says, as many as our children of God are led by the spirit, not led by their appetites, not led by their flesh, not led by whatever their body wants. So we're just saying, body, you don't run my life. My spirit is in charge of my life, where God lives and where God dwells. Uh, we're fasting for 21 days, and you, you might want to miss a breakfast, and maybe, or maybe you're missing lunch, or maybe missing supper. Maybe you have a combination. You work that out, whatever works best for you in your scenario. But don't just miss a meal. Otherwise, it's just a diet or, a, or an exercise of, of losing weight or something. Rather, in that time, pray. Get away for half an hour, an hour, and during that time, we're praying. So that's an important piece of it. Uh, you want Cut out some other activities as well. Maybe you're saying, during this time, I'm not going to binge on Netflix, or during this time, I'm not going to be social media. Whatever distracts you so that you can concentrate on spending time in prayer. Uh, we have a website that has a lot of more information about fasting. As I mentioned, for some of you, it might be brand new. I'm not so sure how to fast. I'd like some more information about it. I'd just like to build my faith up on it. Are there some other messages on it? And so we have resources for you there that would help you. And then join us in prayer on Saturday mornings. Uh, join us in prayer. We'll have the church doors open. Come out and, and pray um, and uh, make time for it and, uh, and, and, and join us. Part of a corporate prayer is even if it's not your preferred way to pray, you just come together to pray. And uh, we, we get in groups, we pray. So part of a corporate prayer and fasting is we need to be not just fasting, but we need to be, need to be praying. So that's a little bit about what we're going to be doing, how to participate. The big question is, well, what are we fasting for? And it's no surprise to you that our country needs prayer. And we have an election on October 21st. So we're fasting from the 1st to the 21st. And one of the things we're praying for is for our country. Back in 1857... Uh, America, uh, England, those countries were, th th there was a dark period over the land. When you read about revival, Winkney Prattney writes in his book about revival, the condition of the country was there was a lot of greed, there was a lot of gambling, there was a lot of corruption in the world, there was, uh, uh, like we would have today, money laundering, there was uh, uh, a lot of high immorality, despite the fact in the U.S., Five out of the 30 million people were strong Protestant church-going people, yet the country was very indifferent to what was going on. There was atheism was rising, agnosticism was there, indifference to the church world. All these conditions were there during that time. And then in New York, some business people got together and began to pray. It started just with a handful, and pretty soon some other business people came. And one of the key things that started that revival was people in the marketplace, because they said, something has to change. They knew if it kept going the way it was, it wouldn't be healthy for the country, it wouldn't be healthy for families. And so a lot of this actually started in the business world, people coming together at lunch hour to pray. And there in 1857, they ended up having 10,000 people in New York from workplace come to pray. And that sparked something. Wherever you have a change in a country and in a nation uh, where the moral climate changes, there's always at the headwaters people coming together to pray. And the church has a role to play in the upcoming election. We should all vote, of course. We should be involved and serve and volunteer, especially if you're called to that arena. God will call some of us to be in that arena. 
Some of us are called to be in the music. Some of us are called with gifts to serve in the hospital. Some of us are called to serve in a ministry realm. Some of us are called as administrators or accountants or lawyers. And, and some are called to serve and to volunteer in that area. And if that's you, uh, it's a good time to do it. But one thing we're all called to do as a church is we're called to pray. That's something unique that the church does. God's not calling government organizations to do that. The police force, they have a different role. The educators have a different role. But to the church, he said, I've given you power and authority to turn over serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. You have authority to cast out devils. You're the ones that have authority in the spiritual realm over principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and the wickedness in the high places. It's you, church, that I gave that authority to. You must rise up. And we see things happening on ground level, but in the spiritual realm, and in, in the high places, there's this spiritual activity, and it's the church that he's called to be it in a spiritual war, if you like, at that time. He did give us the armor of God, amen? amen? Why? And right after Paul talks about the armor of God, he says, pray. So much about the armor is about being in prayer. So we need to pray for our nation. As the Bible says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the powers of darkness. Who does the wrestling? The church. That's our role. And so during that 21 days, we're going to be praying for our country, praying for our leaders, praying for our politicians. Every one of them need prayer. Everyone running for the prime minister's office needs prayer. Our prime minister today needs prayer. Whether you agree with her politics or not, the Bible never says, you know, if they agree with your politics, then pray for the politician. If you don't agree with them, then don't pray for them. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible just says, pray for the leaders of your land. And you have to remember, when that was written, they were living under some pretty oppressive government leaders. It wasn't pretty, but God asked them to pray. So we're going to be praying for our election. We're saying, God, you can move the heart of a person. You put in the right members of parliament. God, be involved. May we not be indifferent. May we not, oh, okay, Sarah, Sarah. We live in Canada. It'll be okay. Whatever happens, happens. I'm fine. I have enough. It doesn't matter. Jesus would say to us, then, as he said to the church at Laodicea, he said, you think you have no need, but actually you're miserable, you're wretched, you're poor, you're blind. Repent from your indifference. Now, there's a call that I think Jesus is saying to the church today, including Coastal Church, you watching online, I think he's saying, don't be indifferent. He says, if you're lukewarm, I spit you out. I'd rather have you cold than that, but let's be, let's be in, engaged in this. And one of the things that fasting does is it breaks indifference. It, it causes us to, the, it just clears the air for us. And we, we again see things that God the Father is seeing. So we're praying for our country. We're praying for the outreach of our church. Thank God, Pastor Karen gave you a great report of, of what happened there at uh, Richmond campus, a great start. Many people coming out there. God's been doing amazing work online. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I'll give a shout out because I don't know who you are, but there's a group that meets in Portland at a coffee shop and they watch our service online and that's their church. They're in a coffee shop in Portland. And so they, they wrote in and said, that's right now they're new. And so they, that's, that's their little church service. And so they're there, you know, so if you're, if you're there in Portland watching, we give you a big welcome. <laughs> or maybe you're watching with some others in some other coffee shop. We just want you to know we care about you, and you're part of us, and you're part of the family. So we're praying for the outreach of our church, whether it be through online, whether it be through Eden Cafe, right there in the heart of the poorest postal code where there's so much injustice, so much hurt, so much pain in that area. But not just there. You can look across the street and see a high rise, and there's hurt there. There's people in chains across the street from us. Come on. We have to see that. We have to be, we have to be uh, stirred to pray for God, free people, just free people. When Jesus sat down there at the uh, early part of his ministry in the temple, and, they, and they, wrote, they put out the Bible, and they read from it, and, and he picks a passage, he said, the spirit of the Lord's upon me, because he, he's called me to set at liberty, liberty, those that are bruised, to heal the brokenhearted, to let the captives go free. That's why the Spirit of the Lord is upon the church. That's why he wants us to bear fruit. And so we want to pray for the outreach, that we're not an inwardly focused church. 
That we're an outwardly focused church. That's always been our heart. God, help us not just to see ourselves, but also to, to reach out, whether it be through Alpha, Freedom Sessions, whether it be through our small groups, that we help other people. And that, we're, that it gets our hearts, that we're, we're not so busy about our own world, we forget to pray for others. Come on. Would you agree? The other day I was uh, just across the street and... And uh, when I I came out, there was a man who was being arrested because he was, he had stolen a bottle of vodka from the liquor store across the street. And my heart just went out because I thought, God, here's somebody, they put him in handcuffs, but but he was handcuffed on the inside. I'm thinking, Lord, for that person you came, are are we reaching them? Are we praying for them? Does it bother us? Because it's it's on God's heart. And one of the things that fasting does is it it awakens us again that our our city needs to have a revival. We've had great revivals in our city before. You know, down the street here, if you went down Georgia Street near Stanley Park on Denman, there was an arena that sat 10,000 people. It was the Denman Arena, sat 10,000 people, where the Vancouver Millionaires used to play. Uh, That was a hockey team, in case you don't know, but they played there. And uh, Charles Price came to our city, and he had, over his meetings, over a couple of years, he had 250,000 people came to his meetings. Many people were healed. The churches all came together in an amazing time, and uh, it, it affected our city. It spilled outside of the churches, and it got into the streets. People would ride the trolley cars, and they were singing worship songs on the trolley car, and they would ask each other, what does Jesus mean to you? That's revival. Uh, because the, the bars were affected by it. The, 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 the city was affected by it. That's revival. Revival is not just happening within the walls. It spills outside the walls. And, it, and it, what it does is it changes again. It brings back the foundation of a healthy country. It, it, re, it restores the streets so we can live on them. And so God's looking. He cares for our city. In the book, uh, we read in, 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 in the scriptures how when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem. He wept over the city. And we weep over the city. We, we, we're ca- it causes us tears to flow because we, we care about people. We, we care about the addict who dies, that we have over a person dying a day from drug overdose. It, it moves our heart. And we say, God, what can we do? Well, we start the prayer. Of course, we have to give action to it, and there's different ways we can cooperate and help with that, but it, prayer is so essential to it. So we're praying for our city. What else are we praying for? We're praying for personal breakthrough. So all that to say about what we're fasting for and all that good stuff. Isaiah 58 is a great passage, and uh, we'll use that during our time. And in your devotions, you can go back and read Isaiah chapter 58. I want to take time to read most of it to you this morning. I'm going to read to verse 12. I'm going to read out of the Message Bible. I think it's really pertinent even to where we are today. It's, a, it's an amazing passage. And the title over this chapter in the Message Bible got my attention. It says, your prayers won't get off the ground. I like my prayers to get off the ground. I like my prayers to be heard. And I like my prayers to be answered. And this title caught my attention. So here we go. Isaiah 58, verses 1 to 12, out of the Message Bible. Shout, exclamation mark, a full-throated shout. Hold nothing back, a trumpet blast shout. Tell my people what's wrong with their lives. Face my family Jacob with their sins. They're busy, busy, busy at worship and love studying all about me. To all appearances, they're a nation of right living people. Law abiding, God honoring. They ask me what's the right thing to do and love having me on their side. But they also complain. Why do we fast? You don't look our way. Why do we humble ourselves? You don't even notice. Well, here's why. The bottom line on your fast days is profit. You drive your employees much too hard. You fast, but at the same time you bicker and fight. You fast, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you do won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fast day I'm after to show off humility, to put on a pious long face, parade around solemnly in black? Do you call that fasting? A fast day that I, God, would like? This is the kind of fast day I'm after to break the chains of injustice, to get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in is seeing you do, share your food with the hungry, Invite the homeless poor into your homes. Put clothing on shivering, ill-clad. 
being available to your own families. Do this and lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteous will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call for help and I'll say, here I am. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins, if you're generous with the hungry and start giving yourself to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I'll always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiness of places, firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild, renovate, make the community livable again. Isn't that a good passage? Right there, folks, that's a description of what kind of fast that God wants. In the book of Matthew, where Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, we have the Lord's Prayer. You also have the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, when, just before the Lord's Prayer, the disciples come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And they could have said anything. They could have said, Jesus, teach us how to be a good speaker. Jesus, teach us how to communicate or teach us how to organize, uh, any number of things. Teach us how to be a, a good writer. But they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because they had watched Jesus, they'd observed him, and they saw something, that his prayer life was a secret for his power in public. If you have a healthy prayer private life, you'll have power in public. And they saw there was a connection between the two, and so they're saying, Lord, teach us, teach us how to pray. So... Of course, Jesus then goes and he gives them the Lord's Prayer. So let's just stop here for a little bit this morning. If you're watching online, you can think along with us here. So if the disciples are saying, Jesus, teach us how to pray, then obviously Jesus is a teacher, right? So let's stop and think about a teacher for a bit. And maybe you have a favorite teacher that you had in school or university or whatever, but just help me a bit. We can use some audience participation this morning. And so what would you say is an attribute of a good teacher? What would you think of an attribute of a good teacher? Just give me a shout out here this morning and we'll, we'll, we'll accumulate some thoughts on this. Patience. Patience. All right. I agree. Patience is an attribute of a great teacher. What else is an attribute of a good teacher? Passionate. Passionate. Okay, patient and passionate. And listening. A good listener. What was another one here? Compassion. Compassion. Knowledge. Knowledge, yes. Experience. Experience. There was one over here. Inspired. Inspired. Wisdom. Wisdom. Anybody else? Leads by, example. Leads by example. That's a great one. Yeah, they're all great. Anything else? What's an what's a attribute of a good teacher? Humble, cares. These are all attributes of a good teacher. Now, was Jesus all those? Yeah. Jesus is all of those things. And, and of course, Jesus not only lived by example, but Jesus gave an example, right? He's a teacher. He said, well, let me teach you how to pray. So a teacher will say, here's an example of how to do this. So he said, if you want to pray, here's an example of how to do this. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer. Well, if Jesus is a teacher and we're the student, now let's think about, well, what's an attribute of a good student? What makes for a good student? Let's give some shout-outs again here this morning. Teachable. teachable. Yeah, that would be number one. Teachable. Okay, what else? Good listener. Willing to learn. Willing to learn. Yeah, what else? Hand in your assignments. Hand in your assignments. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said that uh, earlier, sir, show up for class. And <laughs> I was not a good student in all my classes, I'll have to admit. <laughs> Because some classes I just flat out skipped. All right. Anybody else? What, what makes for a good student? Willing to help. What is it? Willing to, help others. Willing to help others, right? There's one over here. Curious. Available, curious. Palliable. Palliable. Yeah, those are all good attributes of the student. Uh, so we have the teacher and we have the student. And Jesus is the teacher. He teaches us how to pray, right? He said, I'll leave you my spirit. My spirit will teach you. My, tear, my spirit will guide you. So the Holy Spirit comes to teach us. One thing he'll do, the spirit of Jesus will teach you how to pray. So now we have the teacher, we have the student. What, where's the classroom? What makes for a good classroom? Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 that when we pray, again, not if, but when you pray, 
go into your room and close the door. And when you are in private there or in secret, pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So the classroom is that private place, that prayer room or closet, some translations, or it's just where you get alone with God. So let's think about the classroom for a bit. Think about a classroom that you love going to, and uh, what was it about that classroom that you wanted to go there and learn? What was it? What's an attribute of a good, of a good classroom? A good Have a good teacher. Yes, amen. All right, that's a good one. What else? Sorry? I still didn't get it. Feeling safe, yes, absolutely. Has to be safe. Distraction-free, quiet, yeah, good classrooms. What else? Organized. Organized, community. Think of your classroom. That, what class did you love to go to in high school? Or what class did you love to go in university? What, what, why did you want to go there? Fun. fun, yes, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> you like to go because it's fun, right? It's like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, I got to go to this class. What a drag, you know, watching your clock. When do I get out of here? You didn't, you didn't want to go to class for that. I want to change your concept of prayer because Jesus is there to teach. The classroom is this private place. It shouldn't be a drudgery. There will be days we don't feel like praying, but it's not based on feelings. It's based on faith and trust, belief, going to God by faith. But the key is that in the room where Jesus teaches us to pray, there's someone who's really, really waiting for us to be there. He makes it safe. He makes it fun. He knows our heart, and that is your father. Your father's there. Your father's there. He said, but I don't know how to talk to my father. Jesus said, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to pray. I went to my garden. That's where I prayed. You take a place, you pray, and there you're going to find your father. When he taught them to pray, he said, and when you pray, go in your room and shut your door. And your father, your father, who sees in secret, who knows you, he's going to be there. Dad's there. Papa's there. Daddy's there. He doesn't say, Old Testament they pray, but you don't find them praying to the Father. You'll find them talking about the God of the angel armies, or Jehovah Jireh, God who supplies, or Lord God, or God Almighty. But you don't hear them saying Father. Why is that? Why in the Old Testament you don't hear David praying Father? But yet Jesus taught us to pray to the Father because Jesus made it possible for us to have a relationship with the Father. In the Garden of Eden, something was lost. One of the things that was lost when man sinned was the intimacy that there was between God and mankind. It says that Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the cool of the day. They had fellowship. They, they, had, they had this relationship. For times, things were spoken, and times, things weren't spoken. There was just this beautiful relationship between them and their heavenly father. And that was broken. Sin separated. But when Jesus came and died for us, he paid the price on the cross that that sin would be forgiven and we could again come back and he would call us daughter, he'd call us son, and we would call him father. In the book of Titus, it says in Titus chapter 3 verse 5, that it's not, we're not saved by our works. Not by the good things we've done, but by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit. Washing of regeneration. Washing of regeneration. What does regeneration mean? It's a Greek word, palin. And palin literally means this. It's two Greek words. It means back to and Genesis. Back to Genesis. Back to Genesis. When we are saved, we go back to Genesis. Where in Genesis? We go back to being able to have the same kind of koinonia, intimate fellowship with our father that Adam and Eve had in the garden. That's why he says, now, now you guys, you get to come to the closet and you get to be with the father. He says, so when you pray, pray to the father. Mm. So in the Sermon on the Mount, there's three assumptions, giving, praying, fasting. And between, sandwiched between prayer is giving and fasting. Both of those are releasing something we have. 
When I fast, I'm, gr- I'm letting go of something to pray and hold on to something I can't see. I'm letting go of a meal I can see to grasp something which I can't see, which is my intimate communication with the Father. He said, there's, there's this power that comes in the closet when we pray, when we get to be with our Father. What a privilege it is. So in this prayer time and when we're fasting, Jesus had told the disciples, when you're fasting, you know, don't, don't look all gloomy and don't put that on. Rather, when you're fasting, fast and pray for what's on God's heart. He told them when they're praying, don't, don't be like the, 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 the heathen. They, they pray using a lot of words, thinking all their words will make God hear them. He said, therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask. He said, well, why do I need to ask them? What Jesus was saying was this. Your father knows you. Your father, your papa, your daddy knows you. Parents know their kids. They know their kids just does something. I know what they want. They want this. But they still like them to ask because it's honoring, it's respectful, and it allows you to participate. Cheryl and I have been married for 41 years, and she'll just look at me, and she says, I know what you're thinking. And I said nothing. I don't, and if I talk to her, sometimes I just have to say one or two words, and, uh, and she gets it. If, it was, if I was talking to a stranger, I'd have to use a book to describe it. But I don't have to use a book to her because she knows me. God knows you. He knows you so intimately. You don't have to compel an unwilling father. You don't have to try to convince him. You just share out of your heart, God, this is where I'm at. And your father hears you. I don't know about you, but for me, that's a relief. Because he knows you that well. He loves you. And we can pray in that place that way. When we're fasting, we're not fasting for what we, what we're fa- we want to have God's heart when we fast. Remember the Lord's prayer was thy name, thy kingdom, thy will. And then we said give. But we don't say give until it's thy name, thy kingdom, thy will. First, we're thinking about who's in the room, the Father. God, what are you interested in? What's on your heart? We ask God to give us our daily bread, but I'm thinking about what do you need? So if Jesus was to come here today in the flesh, and if he was to ride into Vancouver, what do you think would cause him to weep? That's where we want to have our prayers generated from. Would Oppenheimer Heart Park cause him to weep? Would the lonely person who's shut in in a high rise across the street cause him to weep? Would the elderly who's in the West End who hasn't been out of her apartment for three weeks cause him to weep? Would it be the teenager who's bullied at school cause him to weep? Would it be the one who sticks a needle in their arm tonight, fearful that maybe fentanyl will be in them, cause them to weep? What, what, what causes Jesus to weep? Is it the fact that we can't solve the homeless problem in our city? Does, would that cause them to weep? We try to control things in our country. We try to control guns, and, but we, in Toronto, we have a problem. In other places, we have a problem. We, we try to control other things. We try to control the way we waste things so we don't have climate change, but it doesn't seem like we're getting a handle on that. It doesn't seem like we're getting a handle on homelessness or gun control or any other, other issues because it's not an outside issue. First, it's an inside issue. How can we control that if we don't change the heart? Jesus said, out of the heart proceed evil things. Of the heart. Who changes the heart? Jesus changes the hearts. Who does he use? Us. Us. Where does it start? Prayer. We will never go to action if we're not even moved to pray about it. Well, let me say that again. We'll be never moved to action if we're not even moved to pray about it. So God's challenging us as a church. He's causing us to humble ourselves. He's saying, get your eyes off yourself. You're for no more. And let's pray about the needs of others in our city. I have not covered half the message on Isaiah 58. So (laughs) study it, look into it, because that whole chapter is filled with so many promises. Let me just put up one verse out of Isaiah where it starts off with this word then, Isaiah chapter 58. Later on it says, when you're fasting, there's a lot of benefits for it. And there's this word then. Then your light shall spring forth. Then your healing shall spring forth. Then your righteousness shall go before you. What's righteousness here mean? It means it gets you on the right path again. I don't know how it all works, but fasting just clears the, the fuzz out. And I'm also like, oh yeah, I'm on the right path again. I, I, I'm seeing now the, what I should do. 
Healing comes, literally physical healing comes during times of fasting. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. God's presence is around you. All that to say, there's a lot of benefits to fasting personally, not to mention what's changing as you pray and fast for others. At this point, I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you don't know God as a father. You believe there's a God. You know that he's there, and you can see a designer in creation, and, and uh, you, you realize God's there, but you don't have this personal relationship with him. Jesus came to make that possible. What he does is he removes the shame of things we've done wrong. He removes guilt. He brings peace where there wasn't peace into our heart. And the greatest miracle, that's the most fantastic thing, to be born again for God's spirit to come and live within your spirit. And that can happen right now today. You say, well, how do I do that? It's simple, it's a choice where you pray and you just say, Father, I receive what Jesus has done for me and I would love to have you live in my life. I wanna follow you and know you and I'm willing to accept what Christ did for me. It starts right there. So let's take a moment to pray. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and we'll all pray out loud if you're watching online. Please pray with me. It's a very simple prayer. We'll pray this together. Let's pray out loud together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I open up my heart. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I accept what Jesus did when he died for my sins so I could know you, so I could know you as a father so I can have communion with you. I accept you today, Lord. Amen.